Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Now, yesterday we finally got to show you what the new Intel Core i9 9900K and Core i7 9700K processors have to offer. In summary, the 9900K was fast, but not really fast enough to justify the price, and that now appears to be the general consensus among reviewers. Along with the high price, the other major issue was the high temperatures. Again, most reviewers were reporting very high stock temperatures using high-end coolers, and that basically um, killed, limited, hurt the overclocking performance of these new chips. In my review, I spent quite a bit of time talking about these shockingly high uh, thermals. I expected that the 900K was going to be a seriously power-hungry CPU, and therefore it would be a rather hot item. I just didn't expect Intel's first soldered chip in a very long time to run quite as hot as it did. Using relatively low voltages at 5 GHz saw the 9900K peak at 100 degrees with the Corsair Hydro Series H100i Pro RGB or Noctua NHD15. And we're talking about some pretty premium coolers here. This was actually worse than what we saw previously with the 8700K at 5.2 GHz. Granted, the 9900K packs 33% more cores, but it's soldered, whereas the 8700K uses Intel's notoriously rubbish thermal paste. In the past, I've delitted the 7700K and 8700K chips with pretty amazing results. Using liquid metal drop temperatures at least 20 degrees, though a big part of that improvement was achieved by removing the IHS glue, which reduces the gap between the CPU die and the heat spreader. Still, we know that soldering CPUs works a lot better than the pace method that Intel's been using to save on production costs for years now. We know this because Intel's desktop CPUs ran much cooler back when they were soldered in 2011, and that was the Sandy Bridge uh, days for the mainstream desktop processors, and then the high-end parts were soldered uh, right up till Broadwell E in 2016. As a quick example, the Core i7-3770K running at 4.7 GHz using 1.35 volts would peak at just over 90 degrees running an Ida64 stress test, and that was with a large sort of tower style air cooler. Under almost the exact same conditions, but with 1.4 volts, so a bit more voltage, the 2600K ran at least 20 degrees cooler. So that being the case, I was expecting the 9900K to be something special, and not the kind of special that it turned out to be. Anyway, what I wanted to know was how much better is the soldered method used by the 9900K than the paste of the 8700K or 8086K as they are essentially the same CPU and I will be using the 8086K for my testing as I just had that CPU uh, laying around. The 8700K is busy in my GPU test rig. Anyway, to find out, I disabled two 9900K cores, which effectively turns it into an 8700K or 8086K. Uh, admittedly, it's far from an exact science as the 9900K is a physically larger CPU packing uh, more L3 cache, uh, but it's about as close as we can get with the hardware I have available. The Core i5-9600K might make for a better comparison, but I am still waiting for my chip to arrive, so we can revisit that down the track if need be. That said, the 9600K is basically just a 9900K with two of the dies disabled, but you do get a smaller L3 cache. Anyway, this comparison should give us a pretty good idea of just how much of an improvement Intel Stim makes. For the first test configuration, I locked both the 9900K and 8086K at 4.5 GHz on the MSI Z390 Godlike. Blender was used to place full load on all cores, and again, both CPUs were tested with just six cores active. And for this test, the voltage options were left on auto. This saw the 9900K running at 1.16 volts for the most part, and the 8086K at 1.26 volts. The 9900K saw a peak core temperature of 61 degrees, and the XTU software also reported a 61 degree package temperature. The 8086K, on the other hand, went as high as 74 degrees in the package, with a peak core temperature of 72 degrees. So for the 4.5 gigahertz auto voltage comparison, the soldered method reduced temperatures by 11 degrees, a 15% reduction, though as I noted, voltages are also 8% lower. The package TDP was also 16% higher on the 8086K, hitting 125 watts, opposed to just 107 watts for the 9900K. That being the case for the next test, I locked the voltage at 1.35 volts on both CPUs, leaving the operating frequency at 4.5 gigahertz. This evened things up, and now the 8th gen processor was hitting a package TDP of 145 watts, while the 9th gen chip hit 144 watts. So basically the same figures there. 
That's about a 16% increase for the 8086K from the previous test and 35% increase for the 9900K. This saw the 8086 hit a peak package temperature of 88 degrees and a core temperature of 87 degrees with a typical load voltage of 1.373 volts. The 9900K on the other hand peaked at a package temperature of 79 degrees and 78 degrees for the cores while running at 1.366 volts. So that's a 9 degree improvement for the 9900K allowing it to run 10% cooler. That's a decent result for the soldered CPU. That said, we are almost already at 80 degrees, so how much hotter do things get at 5.1 gigahertz with the same 1.35 volts? And what are the improvements over the six core eighth gen part? If you recall, I opted to run my 8700K test rig at five gigahertz as the temperatures were much more acceptable than what I was seeing at 5.1 gigahertz. And the same is true for the soldered 9900K. Running at an average of 1.38 volts, the 8086K hit a peak temperature of 94 degrees for both the core and package. This resulted in a package TDP of 188 watts. So pretty toasty stuff, and again, this is why we decided to run these processes at 5 gigahertz for our GPU test system. In comparison, the 9900K peaked at 91 degrees for the core and 90 degrees for the package. The average voltage during the test was 1.366 volts, and this resulted in a package TDP of 181 watts. So this means when overclocking, the soldered chip was just three degrees cooler than what we saw with the eighth gen model using paste. This also explains why we saw a 98 degree operating temperature with all eight cores active. That's actually a smaller increase than what you'd probably guess based on the six core results. So why does the 9900K go from offering a nine degree improvement over the 8086 at 4.5 gigahertz to just three degrees cooler at 5.1 gigahertz? Well, my guess would be that we're reaching a thermal bottleneck with the 9900K. Uh, Debao recently discovered when delitting one of the ninth gen processors that the die is significantly thicker than that of the 8700K. I won't give his exact measurements, but if you want those, please go check out his video. It's certainly worth having a look at. As Debauer notes, the thermal conductivity of the silicon isn't great. So the more of it you have, uh, the more thermal resistance you'll face. And this appears to be an issue for the 9900K. It's my assumption that this isn't as much of an issue at 4.5 gigahertz, but as we increase the thermal output, the silicon bottleneck becomes more of an issue as it starts to degrade thermal performance to the point where soldering the IHS is of little benefit. Proving this, Debauer sanded down the Core i5-9600K silicon by just 0.2 of a millimetre, and this reduced temperatures by 5.5 degrees, and that's a rather significant improvement. Again, if you want a full rundown of all the testing, please visit Debauer's channel. On a slightly different subject, a few viewers were a bit uh, confused or concerned by my findings in yesterday's video, claiming that the 9900K shouldn't really be that much hotter than the Ryzen 7 2700X, as they both are 8-core 16-thread CPUs, and they are both soldered. Well, the main reason why the 9900K was so much hotter was because of what we just saw in this video, clock speed. The 9900K with just six cores active went from 78 degrees at 4.5 gigahertz, just 91 degrees at 5.1 gigahertz. And that's a 17% increase in operating temperature. The 2700X can be overclocked to around 4.2 gigahertz, but by default runs at an all core clock frequency of 3.8 gigahertz with the Wraith Prism box cooler, about 3.9 gigahertz with an aftermarket closed loop cooler, for example. Also helping manage thermals is the CCX design, which doesn't uh, pack the cores as densely. Basically you get grouping of four cores rather than one big block of eight. So that, I imagine that helps quite a bit. Uh, basically Intel has just been too aggressive with their clock speeds though, and this has resulted in eight core CPU that's almost too hot to handle. As for the silicon, well, there's likely a number of reasons why Intel has had to increase the height, and I doubt any of them have anything to do with them being incompetent, uh, as some of the viewers have suggested in the comments of yesterday's video. Pretty sure the Intel engineers know exactly what they're doing, and they may be quite limited in what they have to work with at the moment, but they know what they're doing all the same. As I understand it, soldering the 8700K would be uh, much more risky as the silicon could crack during the heating of the soldering process. Therefore, Intel's been forced to increase the thickness of the silicon to better handle the stresses of the heating process required to melt the solder. A uh, thinner silicon would complicate the process, likely making it uh, more time consuming and therefore more costly. Then there's the issue of the thickness of the solder, uh, which is quite thick, and some of you suggested in yesterday's video again that it is too thick and Intel messed up here. And well, that could be possible, maybe it is too thick. 
Uh, but I suspect Intel faced a few issues here as well, one being damage, a thinner solder. I would be more prone to cracking, that seems quite obvious, uh, particularly uh, after prolonged use. These chips heat up quite fast, and then depending on the cooler use, they can uh, cool down quite rapidly, and this places a lot of stress on the solder layer. Now, you can delead the 9900Ks. Intel uh, didn't want to go with a super hard solder, again, to try and avoid cracking. Uh, there's certainly more work involved to clean it up, opposed to what we saw with previous generation CPUs, such as the 8700K. It's much harder to remove the solder than it is to just wipe away the paste. But when doing so and reapplying with liquid metal, that will reduce temperatures by a further 5 to 10 degrees. So there is that. However, we're not really fans of deleting here at Harbour Unboxed. It voids your warranty, it can be a risky process, and really we'd just rather you didn't have to, particularly when spending at least $500 on a brand new CPU. Not to mention $500 on a CPU that is unlocked and is intended to be overclocked. Admittedly, it is a fun and challenging experiment for mad enthusiasts with deep pockets. But for those of you who just want to overclock without getting the lab code out, uh, the crazy high 9900K temperatures will be uh, quite frustrating. They certainly were for us. At the end of the day, it seems like Intel is really just pushing everything to the, uh, the limits, and therefore they were forced to solder these chips in order to maximize the thermal conductivity. Overall though, it's still a better method as we are seeing improved thermal performance, especially out of the box thermals. Unfortunately though, we are only talking about three to four, maybe five degrees when overclocking. And that is going to do it for this one. If you did enjoy the video, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe for more content, and if you appreciate the work we do at Harrowbox, then consider supporting us on Patreon. Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.